and there we were on the highway about 65 to 70 miles an hour and there was no median between us and the oncoming traffic and this bend in the road comes a gentle bend and the oncoming car simply does not take the bend and and in a flash of a second that car that should have veered away from us what drove straight into us at an impact of about 140 miles per hour Welcome to the show today, folks. We have a very special guest, Dr. Marina Hoffman. Uh, she is a PhD, earned PhD. She teaches at Palm Beach Atlantic University. She has written a award-winning book. We'll have it in the description. Uh, women, women in the Bible, small group Bible study. You'll wanna get a copy of this for sure. And so Marina, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So. So just give us a little background on yourself. Sure. As you noted, I teach at the university and I've been married for about 15 years now and I have a daughter and I had the pleasure of living here in South Florida. I say that, Kim, because I haven't had a winter in about eight years now. So it's very nice. You're used to the Canadian winters. That's correct. That is right. Yeah, so things were just going great for you. You were, what, 32 years old? You just finished uh, getting your doctorate degree and um, happily married your husband. Uh, Y'all are driving down the road. Tell us what happened. That's right. And it was a beautiful day in February. We were going home. It was a long trip. And there we were on the highway about 65 to 70 miles an hour. And there was no median between us and the oncoming traffic. And this bend in the road comes, a gentle bend, and the oncoming car simply does not take the bend. And, and in a flash of a second, that car that should have veered away from us what drove straight into us at an impact of about 140 miles per hour. And really, there's no, there's no statistics of survival at that impact. It's so huge, the devastation to the body to be shaken at that speed we were it was a miracle we even survived and through that your husband he uh he saw the car coming over and he did something really heroic on his part uh definitely saved his life and yours as well he he got out of the driver's seat covered you up uh, to protect you from all of the glass and the airbags and everything that was going to be happening upon impact yeah it was amazing because this whole entire moment of my life took about a half second in my mind. And I simply had one thought, Ken, and it wasn't about the Lord. I thought I'm dead. That's the only single thought I had. It was not spiritual at all. My husband, on the other hand, for him, that slight moment of time played out in about five minutes. It was play by play. Sometimes movies do this, right? Where things slow right down. That was his reality. A hormone was released in his body that made him hyper attentive to every detail. So when he lost control of the car, meaning that the brakes had completely engaged, the steering wheel had engaged, there was nothing he could do with his seatbelt on still, he threw his body on top of mine. And indeed he took all the impact of the airbags and the miracle was as you say it saved his life because the oncoming engine ended up pushing our jeep engine into the driver's seat so you can imagine when the jaws of life come and all the emergency workers he is in the middle of the car not crushed to death in the driver's seat it did crush his hip he had a lot of he had eight bro broken ribs on one side a crushed hip all kinds of problems but he was alive and he also saved his knees for me, the fact that the airbags hit him saved my life because I had internal injuries. So I had four lacerations to my bowels and I was bleeding out on the inside. And the surgeon said, we have no idea how you're alive. If those airbags had hit you or anything, you would have died on the spot. And if you had gotten out of the car, you would have died before you ever stood up. So it was one after another, the way that God was there in that moment. And even the fact that I didn't stand up was because there was a firefighter who was in the vehicle in front of us, two MT workers in the back they, behind us. They came and bear hugged me against my will, against my wishes, fighting and screaming literally to get out of the car. They stayed with me for 48 minutes until the ambulance could strap me down. I don't remember that. I sound like a crazy person, but I share it, Ken, because again, all these 
people that God brought right in that moment that to me were like life-giving angels. Yeah, it was like a miracle y'all survived. I believe the investigating officer said they ran all these different simulations and there was just zero probability that you and your husband should have been alive. And then the fact that that God placed the retired police officer there to, to hold you down and the EMT to be there, um, that's another miracle in itself. And then the fact that well, when you finally got to the hospital, I think the surgeon was there having lunch. I mean, who wants to eat uh, hospital food? No, here she is on her day off and she's eating hospital food. That in itself is remarkable. She comes over and looks at me right away and all the nurses are doing what they've been trained to do. They're doing step-by-step -step process to give me dyes, a dye test to see where the holes are to patch me up really simple and easy, uninvasive. And yet she comes and looks at me and says, there's no time for any of that. Cancel everything, roll her as she is with whatever condition she's into the OR right now. She washed up and cut me open. And, you know, she was an older lady. She studied under different processes and she knew how to remove all my organs one by one. She manually found the four holes, fixed them up and put me back together. So what could have been a very small surgery was an epic 10 hour surgery. But again, because she could see that I was literally minutes away from death, thank God again, that the right person was there to sustain my life. Yeah. Now it's just another miracle that the fact that she was there in the hospital ready to roll. So from the time when she finished operating the 10 hour surgery, uh, you know, your life's hanging by a thread there. Uh, what was your, what was the time frame as far as um, rehabbing in the hospital and staying in the hospital? How, how long were you in the hospital? And I know you had some brain trauma and injury. Uh, so share a little bit of that. Yes, for five days, I was in ICU and I don't remember any of it. I felt completely alone and very heartbroken that no one in the entire world loved me and would be with me. This is was my perception, although it was not true. But at the same time, I felt this most incredible presence of the Lord as real to me as if the Lord had been there in the flesh. And I've had a relationship with the Lord my whole life, but I experienced the presence of God in a way that. I almost can say, Ken, I didn't even know it was possible. He was so real. He, I know, I knew that the Lord was there in the room with me, holding me together. And you know, there's that verse in the New Testament that says to live is Christ. And I think normally we take it as a metaphor and it's spiritually encouraging, right? The life of Christ. For me, Ken, during those five days, it was as if Jesus Christ was truly the reason that I was able to live and breathe, even physically. So it was beautiful. And yet the gift of nurses, they told me in the days to come, as I returned to the hospital, there was the head of ICU. And except for fair moments when he would take time off his shift, he was with me for 18 hour shifts, one after another. He wouldn't leave my side. He had his meetings in my room. I don't remember any of it. My family came, of course, to be by my side. But in those moments, it was very hard because my whole life had changed. But yet also to experience the presence of the Lord was incredible. After five days, I left the ICU, spent two more days in the hospital, and then they released me to stay at my sister's house as my husband still was in the hospital. And in some senses, that was the end of the worst part, but it was the beginning of a whole new chapter of trying to recover and deal with the trauma that that accident brought. So part of the trauma, of course, there was a physical aspect of it. But you actually, uh, you couldn't speak for a couple of weeks. Is that correct? That's right. My stuttering was so bad. It was 60 days before I could finally say one syllable of yes without stuttering. And I think because my strength was in communication as a professor in theology and Bible, and I was a writer, this was my strength to be able to talk, to communicate to organize my thoughts very quickly. So Ken, it was devastating to think I can't even tell people my basic human needs. I can't understand them. Everyone has to repeat things over and over. And again, if we're talking about the impact, you know, there was a beauty to it because I really questioned what kind of Christian I was. I wasn't doing anything for the Lord. I wasn't even speaking. Was I as good a Christian in that state of almost a vegetable and completely as needy as a one-year-old was I as good of a Christian as when I was serving the Lord and exhausting myself with all the busyness of ministry 
And so as a doer, I had to really grasp again, what does it mean to be a follower of Christ? And eventually to accept that just sitting on the couch and doing nothing and trying to recover, but resting in the presence of the Lord is for that time, all God asked of me. Yeah, that's very powerful. Uh, sometimes I think you're right. We get so busy doing ministry and, and work. So at this point, you you know, you're, you're struggling with anxiety, severe anxiety, depression. You know, I think COVID was going on and, you know, all this. So you really had to make a decision. You had to stir yourself up and be uh, faithful and, and, and right in the face of fear and just really move out. Yeah, I was definitely impacted by how many professionals said over and over to me, it's a miracle you're alive. You're an incredible person. I, I felt like my life was a wreck. So it was very strange to me that people kept saying I was in, incredible and amazing. So as I slowly in the weeks to come, I began to put things together and I was sitting there in the hospital with my husband. He was in for two months. And I started to Google some of the effects of trauma to understand what had happened to me. And I began to realize the reason people kept saying I was incredible was simply because I was still alive. So many people under that incredible pressure that their whole life has changed. Their, their spouse's life is just devastated. Nothing will ever be the same. You can't talk. You can't practically move without help. In all of that, the weight of it, without the hope of Christ, without the solid anchor, they give up on life and they end up dying, even though they could have lived physically. And Ken, what a heavy understanding to come to. I mean, the fact that, you know, so many people could not survive under that pressure and I was surviving. And I thought again, you know, the life of Christ within us is so powerful. And I knew once again, that it was the Lord who was sustaining me. It was the Lord's will to live within me that really was pushing me on. So I just had to decide that the Lord had brought me that far. And even though I felt like I was right in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death, if the Lord had allowed me to live and allowed me to experience this great trauma, then the Lord clearly had a plan for my life. And the Lord would walk with me and strengthen me and give me everything I needed to recover to the degree that the Lord allowed me to. I just realized my whole life was in his hands. And you know, can there can be so much pressure on a person on all of us when we're going through a hard time or trauma. But what a relief when we can just admit that it's true. You're facing an impossible situation. It is only made possible with the Lord because then all our energy can simply be put in trusting the Lord. And for me to rely on all the ways God had helped me up to that point, I had no other choice to put, to put my faith in the Lord. And I think that is one of the key reasons I survived because I could acknowledge as a person of faith that God was with me and that when I was in my weakness, it was that moment that God would, would be strongest within me. Yeah, I think that's, man, that's very powerful. I think when you have the word of God in you, like you obviously did and you know, I'm thinking of several scriptures, you know, you talk about hope and, you know, I, I know a lot of people don't like the King, King James version, but there's this expression that they gave up the ghost. Now, we wouldn't say it like that nowadays. It would be like, well, you know, maybe they lost the will to fight or they gave up. But, you know, I really like that and how you, you just fought through that and just uh, pulled on the word of God that, that, that you had. Uh, you know, I think that's the difference uh, between making it and not making it many times. I, I know that they were very concerned about you because statistically, again, you know, you, of course, you had zero percent chance of living through the simulations, but they actually had you on a suicide watch. They were worried about you, girl. That's right. For five days because of that weight of discovering in the hours, maybe for some people, the day or two that comes as their brain begins to piece together what's happened. It is such a burden. And, you know, I'll add a piece about having faith in that I think so many of us rely on our feelings to some degree. But I remember as much as I'm saying, I really felt so strongly the Lord was with me in a way that I had never experienced before. The Lord was as real as could be. The irony, Ken, is also I didn't really have the feelings of the Lord, the Lord's presence in another sense. I didn't. I, and it might be because my body was such a mess. 
my brain injury. I don't know. But I remember there was one dark night and it was so hard. I didn't know if I would make it. And I just remember saying to myself, I'm not the first person in this situation, even Israel, right? And I turned to the Old Testament. That's my specialty, my study. I would thought of the different times they were there facing the sound and the rising dust of a coming army. So if you can picture Israel back in the day, not here in the cities, right? But they see, they hear the army coming before they have arrived. They, they see the dust rising from the, the soldiers marching. And in that moment, they had to put their trust in God, regardless of how they felt. And I said, you know, that's how I feel. This accident is like an army that has attacked me much bigger than me. But it doesn't matter how I feel. It doesn't matter if I sense the Lord's presence. I will choose today to put my entire faith in the Lord and gamble everything, which can, that wasn't hard. I didn't really have a lot to gamble. I felt like there's not much left in me, but with everything left on me, I put on the table and I said, Lord, I'm going to put my life in your hands. And I think that's a lovely takeaway for me, for my accident, that sometimes when we don't feel the Lord's presence or we don't see God answering prayer to make that decision to trust in God anyways. Yeah, that's very, very powerful. Well, uh, part of it too, that in, you were at home finally, and you were sitting on your couch and you were kind of struggling about, I think you had a craving for some chocolate. Yes, I did. And you know, I'm sitting there on the couch and I have to say the context is this small, tiny town that my husband moved me to under my great pleading. I said, I cannot take anything. I want silence and solitude. I think it was a 700 person town. We had one light and the road from our community to the stop sign was gravel. So this is a very small town. The, it was like a marketplace as a part of a gas station, right? Where I wanted to go. So I wanted this chocolate and I, and I was miserable because I couldn't go. And I remember it dawned on me, wait a second, why can't I go? And it was like in that minute, the moment, the Lord said, you can choose to stay on the couch or you can choose to go and get a piece of chocolate from the store. And just the realization that whatever happened, I could try was huge. And I'm sorry if it sounds ridiculous, but I got in the car. I was terrified. I drove, you know, what, 10 miles an hour down this dirt road with no other cars in sight, shaking. My knuckles were as white as can be. I don't know. I don't remember what happened. If I made it there, if I bought anything or not. I just remember that when I came back to my house, I couldn't even let go of the steering wheel because I was having such an intense panic attack and I was hyperventilating so much. But there was a wonderful feeling alongside just being shaken to the core was that I tried. And to me, I felt so victorious and so empowered. And that was a huge moment in my recovery because I realized I could do it. I could try anything. And sometimes what we need to have courage in is not the impossible things of life, but just the ordinary things to have the courage to do the ordinary things that are right, the ordinary things God calls us to. And I know you'll like that, Kim, because I talk a bit about that in my book. One of my greatest inspirations, of course, is the woman in the Bible who often do ordinary things, but because of the circumstance around them that made it so hard, they're people of courage. And how beautiful that I felt I had a tiny little share in that feeling as well. Driving down a dirt road was nothing, but the context made it so hard. And to know that sometimes we just have to choose faith over fear and start the engine and drive Ken, because God is with us, but we also have a role to play. No, that's so right. We're, you know, the Bible says we're, we're co-laborers with Christ. You know, God's definitely going to do his part and he's done his part, work miracles in your life. But it doesn't mean that you get to sit around on the couch and not do anything. You took that step of faith and trust in the Lord to walk out of the house, to step into the car, to turn the engine on, to drive down there and come back. And, you know, I think that's, that's part, you know. Uh, God's God's going to come through. It's a matter of where, whether we're going to come through or not for Him. So you know, speaking about that, uh, the book and the women in the Bible, they this they really encouraged you during this time. Uh, so let's just let's dive into that. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, let's talk about Mary. You know, um, someone asked me the other day what was the hardest chapter to write, and that's what I admitted. Because my view of Mary, the mother of Jesus, was so influenced by iconic art, right? Mary's always looking perfect. And more than perfect, she has a halo literally on her head, right? So she looks like an angel. 
And then more than that, she has this perfect child, which I don't think I really noted or reflected on before I had a baby, but I have a baby Ken that never stops moving. So for me to see, to even have a picture where she's not slightly blurred was an effort. And so <laughs> as I became a mom and I'm writing this book and I'm thinking of Mary, all I can think about is how absolutely perfect she was. And I thought, what on earth am I going to say? How can I connect this woman who is so righteous and so honored to be the mother of Jesus with the women who are reading my book? And how can I be encouraged by her? What does she mean to me? What does she say to me as a mom? And Ken, I'll say um, one thought that truly I believe was from the Lord in my book. It was not the result of my own study. But one day I felt the Lord impress on me to think deeply about the, the fundamental contribution of Mary. And as I did, I came to the phrase, she bore Christ really for the world, right? She brought this child into the world. And then I thought in a metaphorical sense, it's something we all participate in. We bear Christ. We bring the message of Christ, we bring the ministry of Christ, and we bring the very nature of Christ to others by bearing the fruits of the Spirit, right? By following Christ, that's our way of bringing Christ to our world, whether the people we live with, our neighbors, our coworkers, the people in our sphere. So, um, you know, in with all respect to Mary and in the incredible task she did, I think we can enter into the blessing of Mary when we too bring Christ to the world in our own ways. Yes, that's, that's good. Well, let's, let's, uh, speaking of the child, uh, they didn't think you were going to have a child, did they? That's right. So I was all messed up. My husband and I, our bodies were so badly damaged. They really did all these tests and said the chance of having a child was literally something like 0 0.0001. And it was totally impossible. That's encouraging. Yeah, I know. I look at this page and I have no idea what the doctor said. How could I pay attention to him when I'm looking at this page with this number that is like basically meaning there's no chance. But again, the Lord works in interesting ways in the situations we face because I had been trying so hard to be as perfect as I could be. What do I have for lunch? What do I have for dinner? Do I do my walk? Am I drinking water? Am I taking all these special pills with all these vitamins? And it was so laborious to try and try to be perfect to get pregnant. And in that moment, I realized as I could be perfect and what would it be 0 0.002, you know, think like this was now not about Marina and my effort. This was now about the Lord. And, and so as I thought of that in a few seconds, I literally felt like a, a heavy backpack I was carrying around was lifted off my shoulders. And I said, yep, well, I had to trust the Lord that I would live after the accident. I had to trust the Lord I would talk again, that I would be able to think for myself, that my husband and I would be able to put together our lives. You know what? Here we go. Two years later, and I'm still in the same position. I need to give this all to the Lord and trust the Lord. And I was reminded that it is much easier to trust the Lord than to try and accomplish impossible situations on ourselves. So again, the irony that this impossible situation was became another opportunity for me to trust the Lord. And of all things, Ken, you know, when I say I tried hard, I prayed day and night. You know, I made I wrote down the promises of the Lord. I put them up on my little side table in my bedroom, on my mirror, my bathroom. I was being as like faithful as I could. And after that, it, over the next day, I called a couple friends and my mom and said, please pray hard for me because I'm going to stop praying. I'm going to pray one last time. And this time I'm going to give it to God entirely because the Lord doesn't need me to meditate on this all day long. It was very stressful. Mm -hmm. And so I actually stopped praying because I said, Lord, I've prayed a thousand times. Now I'm just going to choose to focus on trusting you and I'm putting it in your hands. And what a blessing. I think a few months later, I'm not sure the time, a few months later, I did get pregnant, but it wasn't anything that I did. It wasn't any of my striving at that point. Thankfully, the burden even of prayer had been taken by some friends of mine. And what a source of joy, what a source of healing. Her life to be had all kinds of challenges. And then the Lord brings her into existence. And she has been the biggest source of healing in my life. Of course, right? A little child is full of joy. The joy she brought me, the deep sense of healing through her joy and trust in me, even when I would make mistakes. Ken, you know, she'd be so little, like three. And I'd be at the grocery store and I would pull in. I'm like, wait a sec, why am I here again? 
And she'd be like, it's okay, mom, from the back seat. You need five things. Okay, one. She would list them off. So you know what? God has amazing ways of working. I think possibly her brilliant memory is because she had a mom that really struggled. Um, so, you know, God just, God surprises us in so many ways, truly doing more than we can imagine or even ask for. Yeah, truly uh, the abundant life is in Christ and your faith and the resilience and um, just striving and not, not giving up. And uh, that's a beautiful picture. It looks like that's her behind you there. Yes, that is right. That's her at the age of three. Yeah, just um, just my little angel and a gift that God gave me after so much, so much hardship. God blessed mm -hmm. me beyond my words, beyond what I could have imagined. Yeah, speaking of hardships, let's let's talk about Hagar. She had some hardships too. Yes, yeah, so we have the story in Genesis 16 where Sarah and Abraham want a child. They end up using Hagar, who lives in their home as a servant, as their surrogate to have this child. What we today might say is related to IVF, right? When we feel like we're out of options we face an impossible situation we turn to help much like what they did to hagar except this desire for sarah and abraham although sarah mostly sarah really drives this chapter forward it's her desire for this child this is her plan abraham goes along with it and it's heartbreaking from the perspective of sarah because she does not get what she wants the story changes and by the end this child really is hagar and abraham's and we know this to be ishmael not the child of promise for sarah so it's a heartbreaking story for sarah and when we look at hagar she whatever she was facing and the bible's harsh right she was being abused she was treated very badly by sarah and we can say not rightly right sarah goes above and beyond to mistreat her so in her desperation as a pregnant woman, she ventures into the wild wilderness alone. So she's making some really bad decisions. And now she's in a terrible position. Um, can I can ask, how does she even run away? Is no one watching her? She's carrying Abraham's child, right? So something is very wrong, even in the family setting that she is able to run away. But how beautiful in this messy situation where there's pain on every side, the angel of the Lord comes and meets Hagar. And within a few short verses, Hagar recognizes this angel as actually being the Lord. The Lord speaking to her, giving her hope for the future, giving her a sense of identity for who she is, not in relation to being a servant to Sarah and bearing this child for Abraham. So there's such a turnaround. I think it's a hopeful story. And there's a beauty in it in many ways. I think what impacts so many people is the beauty that this angel of the Lord, the Lord cares about Hagar and where others don't care about her. He sees her and calls her by name and gives her a future and a plan. And not everything works out well. She ends up going back to this situation and we don't know, maybe Sarah continued to mistreat her even well after the child was born. Maybe there was always scorn and hurt and pain. Maybe Abraham never really stands up to defend her. Maybe the community does not rally around her. We don't know these things, but I believe that that encounter with the angel changed who she was. And I can relate to that because sometimes we pray and God impacts our life, but our situation doesn't change. We still have a painful relationship, a financial struggle, a health problem that's not healed. And yet the encounter with God changes us in our perspective so dramatically that we are able to be victorious and even find joy and hope in the midst of that situation. So I think it's her testimony is one that is encouraging for all of us facing challenges. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's, uh, let's pick another one here. Uh, how about uh, Hannah? Yes, well, you know, her story is similar to mine, right? She wanted a child. She waited and waited she prayed. And what I found so inspiring about Hannah is the verse that says she got up and her face was no longer downcast after praying. And she ate and she drank and she went on her way because, you know, the Bible doesn't need to tell us, but if all she was doing is praying at the altar in the temple, there's no way she could have gotten pregnant in that moment. And so what a beautiful picture of a faithful woman who finds joy and strength in the Lord and is able to trust the Lord, even though she knows that prayer has not been answered yet. So I, again, her resilience and her strength and her hope gave me encouragement when I was in the same place. And, you know, 
can to be very honest, I wanted two or three children and I'm so thankful for the one, but what a blessing again with Hannah. It's just this picture of her and Samuel. And she seems to find a great sense of gratitude to the Lord. Of course, the story goes on, but how beautiful that everything that God gives us is sufficient and enough. Yeah, very much so. Uh, yeah, her heart rejoiced at the, at the birth of the child. And then she turns around and her gratitude. She takes him to, to the priest and dedicates him to the Lord. You have a, another one here, adversity, leadership, standing up with Esther. Yes, you know, we're so familiar with the story of Esther. And I think even as we say her name, probably our listeners are picturing a queen and in yeah. glorious robes and beautiful and a crown on her head. And the Bible tells us she was a beautiful woman and she did become queen. Yeah. But what about the road to becoming there? Um, she's this orphan. Her parents have been killed for some reason. She's far from her homeland, her ancestral land. She's being raised by an uncle. So she faces all kinds of challenges. And then she's before in this position where she can go before the king to plead for the lives of all her people. And, you know, who knows when God will call us to do something again that seems so impossible, so hard, requires great courage. But how hopeful to look at the story of Esther and to see that this ordinary young person, no leader, you know, if God was going to use someone to save Israel, why didn't he use Mordecai, right? Mordecai was close to the yeah. king. Mordecai was a leader. He was wise. And yet God chose this young woman and brought other people to support her like her uncle Mordecai. And she took a risk and there was a great outcome. So she did become queen. But in addition to becoming a person of influence, she certainly took courage and the, and how amazing to see how God blessed her actions far beyond what she could have seen. Again, encouraging for us that who are called to do something that we know is hard, that involves risk, and yet to think, well, what kind of salvation might God bring to me and my family and to many people who I'll never meet if I'm willing to be courage, courageous and say yes to the Lord? Yeah, you, you've come so far, I tell you, it's just powerful just sitting here listening to your testimony to think, you know, the car wreck, uh, you should have died. God put somebody in front of you, behind you, they held you down, the doctor being there, and um, just, I'm, I'm moved, and uh, it's uh, very touching. So what would you say to the listeners as far as moving forward and faith and courage uh, what what word would you like to leave with them i think wherever we are that's where god meets us i think of hagar like a woman on the run making some poor choices right in that minute when we are at our lowest point we have an opportunity to experience the presence of god more than we could ever have imagined and maybe ken it's possible that god's presence and reality to us and his willingness to reveal himself in a powerful way is greatest at the very lowest point of the valley of the shadow of death. So nobody wants to walk through the challenging times of life. But if you find yourself there, remember that all you need to do is trust the Lord. The more impossible the situation, the more we can give it over to the Lord. And there's nothing wrong with our weakness because God uses the weak things of the world to shame the wise. And in our weakness, God is our strength. And how lovely if we have our own strength, that's an advantage, but how much greater if our strength is actually the Lord. So it's a much greater place to be, but of course requires so much more faith and trust. And I would say also that I pray our listeners today find joy and strength and hope. These are hard times for all of us. You know, um, I was talking to a friend last night about how I've grown in joy. I've been praying hard for the past year, 2022, that God will give me a deeper sense of prayer. That was my prayer for the year. And I found a greater sense of joy, but Ken, it was so much work. And so now this year I'm saying, Lord, please give me a sense of joy that doesn't take so much effort. I want to have joy and relax. And I want to have joy and be present in that moment with you, Lord. And many times I'm a homeschool mom to find joy in the Lord, joy in my daughter. And to have those times where we can put all the things that concern us about the world, we can leave that in the Lord's hands and take action as we should and stand for truth as we should. But often 
also have those moments of complete rest in Christ and to just soak up, if that makes sense, to soak up the joy of the Lord and the strength of the Lord and to find hope. And what a beautiful opportunity it will be for our joy to flood over and to impact those we live with. And that comes back to us. So I think what a difference we can make in big ways, but sometimes it's as simple as being joyful and hopeful and acting loving in our own home and encouraging the people that are closest to us. And God often rewards us as they have more joy and love. And that comes back to us. Yeah. Well, th thank you so much for sharing your, your testimony, your story with us today. That's just um, very powerful. I know that the listeners will love that. And, um, want to snatch up a copy of your book so i appreciate you being on the show marina well thank you and i hope your listeners are definitely encouraged by the examples of women in the bible they became friends to me during my hardest time so thank you ken for letting me share <laughs>